the interim arrangements for the chief executive. Following that, that decision, whichever way, we will then circulate the interim arrangements as a result of that decision. And that will make it very clear, and we will do that very quickly to all members of the board to ensure that you are aware, not only of their responsibilities, but also their reporting arrangements if and uh, if the decision on the next item is to appoint two and two chief executives. And I think that's, that's as much as... Well, I, I do think it's important because um, as will come out in the next item, um, members of the combined authority have been kept completely in the dark of what's been happening. And when the issue of the next item, where there's some reference to the, the dis, uh, disappearance of the uh, chief executive, um, uh, that was uh, the media statement came out in the name of Carl Fenman as head of HR. Um, and I just, I just think the position we're in is I, I appreciate the next item addresses uh, plans for change, but um, things have been happening and Carl Fenman has had responsibilities which we've had no input or discussion about. I think, I think Councillor Hervey is a complete fallacy that uh, members have been keeping kept in the car. Members have been uh, absolutely consulting. Oh, come on. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh, dear. Uh, you know, if there is a suggestion that members have been kept in the dark and what's been going on at the moment, it is a complete fallacy. And I will say that to the public and I will say that in this meeting as well. People are trying to make a political capital and have a very sensible, essential situation, uh, which we'll discuss further in the next item. But all issues here uh, have been discussed in private with the leaders of this council, in informed cabinet with the leaders on this council, and they've been, been discussed in this meeting as well. Uh, to suggest that, that Councillor Herbert, Councillor Smith, or any other member has not been fully informed of what's happening is, as I say, is a complete palace. Mm. Do I have any other speakers? I'll hold my comments to the next item. Uh, so, uh, uh, Councillor, Councillor Count, uh, you have taken through the recommendations. That, do you have a second? Mm. Councillor Holditch. All those in favour? Thank you very much. Uh, so we would like to ask Carl to return to the room and uh, Councillor uh, and uh, John Hill and Kim Sawyer will be in the room. So as we are, are aware, uh, the uh, previous chief executive resigned um, and uh, left us with a decision to make uh, immediately after his uh, tenure was agreed, uh, uh, the, the finish of his tenure was agreed with uh, the legal team. Uh, we convened a meeting of the command authority meeting the leaders in private where they were all informed of the, the situation. Uh, discussions were then had uh, at length as to the next steps and what we should do. Uh, and in that meeting, uh, with the vote, uh, we agreed to uh, appoint uh, Kim Sawyer and John Hill as joint chief executives for the remit uh, to, uh, to the review of the authority. Uh, it felt it was an appropriate time to review the authority. Um, so, as I said, the leaders have discussed this in private, but this is a public forum, and, uh, and I believe that uh, it is right, obviously, for us to discuss this. So, so in the last uh, item, you said. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry Councillor Sigur, I thought you came forward in the last item as a reference. No, no, I, that was the that was the last item. My apologies. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, so. The Overview and Scrutiny Committee discussed um, a number of matters at some length um, on Monday, um, and we had very serious concerns about the employment processes which were undertaken over the summer. Um, both the employment process um, in relation to the departure of the Chief Executive and the employment process in relation to the appointment of the permanent staff. So just to respond to Councillor Count's um, comment, in the previous discussion about mistakes which were made in the process. 
that, that appears on the paper that you have, I think, with our questions in relation to the Chief Finance Officer, but that's it. that issue was actually about the appointment of the permanent staff, as it says in this question, which is why we're going to raise it at this point. Um, we had a number of concerns. We had a long discussion about that on Monday, um, and in some ways it's a scrutiny discussion looking backwards rather than a matter to the board, which is about things looking forward. So although we had that very serious discussion about those processes, and we do have very serious concerns about the process that was undertaken during the summer, both about the departure of the Chief Executive and about the appointment process that was used for the appointment of, of at least one member of permanent staff over the summer, our questions today are much more in relation to um, the, the current proposals for interim um, for an interim appointment of joint chief executives. So the questions that the um, overview and scrutiny had around the arrangements for these interim chief executives are about how their responsibilities will be shared out, whether both members of staff will be full time or both members of staff will be part time, or whether one will be full time and one will be part time. Um, how we will know who is responsible for decisions on any particular occasion um, and how those responsibilities will be divided up. Because um, the scrutiny committee has serious concerns which have already been expressed on a number of occasions about accountability within this authority. Um, and we are concerned about how joint chief executives can be held accountable for, um, for decisions without it something being said, or like somebody, somebody else was on duty that day. Um, so, so looking forward, those are our questions. Councillor Herbert, you were uh, there. No, thank you to speak. So, uh, you, you, you just said that it's a fallacy that we haven't been involved. Um, uh, what, what I understand, and I don't know the full story, but, but what I understand is that um, uh, the, the events leading to the disappearance of our current chief executive occurred on, on or about the 20th of um, August. Um, you say that we were involved, um, but the first, genuinely, the first time that members of this board, and I can't speak for everybody, but I suspect it's the majority of us, knew that uh, events had occurred um, was over a week later when we um, saw, probably by Twitter or by a different routes, reports in the Cambridge Times. So effectively a process of change had occurred, um, which hasn't, I don't think, been properly explained still, James, albeit that he did answer um, uh, some uh, questions and added information uh, at the scrutiny committee on Monday. Um, to explain why a person, uh, Mark Whiteley, who's still been effectively employed by us to the end of this month, just disappeared in a puff of smoke. So we then get to the position of, uh, of a week later, um, uh, and, and you, you've accepted, I think you said to the scrutiny committee that there was a deal. Well, normally when there's a deal, it's when somebody's actually been asked to leave. Um, so anyway. So I don't think it's fair to say that we've been part of this process, um, uh, albeit that there has been some answers this week. Um, uh, in terms of moving forward, and I will come on to that, because I think we have to move forward, but, but I do go into the position which is in our constitution. And, and the reason for my core concern is there's two parts. One is that only the combined authority may dismiss the head of service. Chapter 18, um, uh, Clause 6 says that, and it says any disciplinary action regarding the head of service should also be done by the combined authority. So I think that is why it's legitimate for us to ask you, James, what happened, and get a clear answer. Um, moving on, to, so that's, if you like, half of my issue. The other half is, what is the best way forward? Um, as I wrote in a letter which was sent to you and to other members of the combined authority on the 2nd of September, I cannot believe that in the position we're in, we've got a better alternative than to seek um, a single interim chief executive. Um, and it's not simple, but they exist. Um, and to get somebody who's external, i.e. Um, to uh, give us 
the, the fresh start that I think that we need um, is to mean the way forward. This report doesn't even say what the roles of the two interim chief executives are. It's not clear, it's completely opaque. Um, I believe they've already started work. I believe you decided this was the approach you wanted to take um, without and without, before any discussion with us as leaders. Um, we are a collective combined authority. Um, the chief executive works for us all, but particularly you as chair. And so in terms of going forward, um, uh, I take the view, and that that's why we put down an amendment on this item um, uh, that Councillor Bridget Smith and I have put forward, that it should be a single post. Um, I find all positions where there are two people doing the same, same job um, open to huge risk, um, and I do think that this combined authority needs the fresh impetus of uh, an external leadership at the officer level, working with you um, um, to get the senior structure in place that we've, let out, uh, that we've not had. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Uh, thank you. Right. Um, so I'd like to formally um, propose an amendment, um, and the amendment will replace uh, point one. I'll read the amendment for the benefit. The combined authority undertakes a recruitment exercise to recruit a single interim chief executive with relevant knowledge and experience to assume the full range of responsibilities related to the post. This will include ensuring the provision of effective support to all of the constituent members of the combined authority. The process should consist of open external competition to ensure access to as wide a pool of suitably qualified candidates as possible. Now I think it's really important that um, we address public confidence in the combined authority and I'll talk about that more in my motion which is coming at the very end of this agenda. There has been great concern about people coming and people going at an unacceptably regular basis. And that destabilizes the organization and affects public confidence and possibly board level confidence as well in the organization. Uh, Scrutiny have very, very rightly pointed out that there's no clarity about shared responsibility, uh, about time. Nobody's talked about the cost of having to interim chief executives. I, you know, I, our salary bill is considerably greater than was originally uh, planned for, and that's a worry. Uh, when um, Scrutiny and Overview talked about responsibility for decision making, I hark back to the delegated authority to spend half a million pounds. You know, is that both the interim uh, chief executives making that decision? Does one of them have? that responsibility, where there's lack of clarity here. Now this isn't the place to debate the, uh, the merits of the two people who you want to put in this position, but it's a very, very big job. You know, we're talking about an area with seven, seven authorities. You know, we've seen, I suspect people have gone because actually the job's just too big to do. So we need, you know, Quite, outsta you know, quite outstanding caliber people with experience of working at that level on this sort of scale. And there is an opportunity here to actually bring somebody in who might end up being our permanent person. You know, this opportunity to grow, grow our own chief executive, but trial, trial somebody out to see if they're actually going to be suitable for the permanent position at the end of it. So, you know, please, members, please think very carefully about my amendment. It is there to actually help us all, you know, strengthen this, strengthen this body, give confidence to the public and to business and to us that actually we can start to really deliver against our priorities. Thank you, Councillor Bibb. I assume you have a second now? Second. Uh, so we are now uh, debating uh, the, uh, the amendment. Uh, Councillor Council. Uh, yes, thank, thank you, Chairman. Uh, yeah, I can't support the amendment. I'll try and explain why. So, a couple of points. You know, the, the size of the job, for example. You know, I'm, I'm the leader of the county council. My chief executive is responsible for budget, budget well in excess of £600 million a year. And yet, she shares the job with my leader to my right, John, another £300 million, I guess, about 6000 employees between that size. 
I estimate, and that's handled by one individual covering two areas. So the area is the same as the client authority, but the actual budget is enormous in comparison. The amount of staff that to deal with and the range of activities far outweigh anything that the combined authority is actually handling at the moment. And yet that's handled by one individual. So to suggest that, that we need one capable individual uh, to, 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 to do this, because that's absolutely necessary when there's actually a proposal that the two can share this, I, I disagree with that point. In terms of the <coughs> what's necessary at the moment, the, the combined authority is it's still a fledgling organisation, a year and a half after it's uh, after it officially started. And during that period of time, we've seen massive, massive change. And we've had to be fleet of foot. And the biggest one of all was taking on the combined of uh, the left, left geography and the left staff. And what we had to do then was actually take what I regarded as a broken organisation into what was starting to be a good organisation here and rejig everything. And here we are trying to move through that process. Too many interests, I agree with you there, but that's the nature of having to start from thread from start and have to deal with these changes. And now we've made a decision that the actual starting structure that we were recruiting to needs to be looked at because we're reducing the footprint of the business board down to the co-terminosity of this area, which is about half the original size. So when we needed twice the amount of employees, well maybe not twice the amount of employees, but when we needed the employees to cover something twice the geography of the employee, that would no longer be picked up first. And that's happening today. That's happening as of, of this week. So what we can do moving forward is we can either go out to a recruitment company, to a headhunter, to try and find us a single chief exec who has very little knowledge of the area, hasn't been through the growing pains that we have, hasn't got the in-depth knowledge of, of some of the stuff that we've got, or we can look at how we can change as we are at the moment and do this review that you, that you mentioned, reviewing the staff, reviewing the governance, which has to change because of uh, co-terminosity, because of the uh, business board, because of the let review, and getting on with those jobs ahead. Now, I, I don't want to go and spend even more combined authority money on an external organisation that actually is going to take many, many, many more months to deliver something that we absolutely need to have ha happen now. Uh, Martin White's lease departure was quite sudden, so it hasn't given us the six months, nine months uh, necessary to uh, and, uh, recruit uh, 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 chief executive. What we need to do is act now. So, um, so uh, you know, the arrangements are, have been talked up between us. Now, we've, we've had these fleshed out at an informal session, right? And we talk about democracy, and we talk about doing the thing that's right by democracy. And yet those people that, that sit around the table and agree something by, by a dem democratic, there are more of one lot that agree than don't, it then comes to light that, okay, that, we don't want the democratic process. What we actually want is we want things done our way and not your way. And that's not very democratic. So it will eventually come to a light. But for the public to be told, there's been no discussions on that, hasn't the process hasn't been uh, tried to iron out in one place. All of us were invited those meetings and all of us discussed it. The fact that we couldn't make, uh, come to an absolute agreement between them one, that's natural. There are seven of us. Not all of us are going to agree on everything. But then to tell the public that we're not involved in the form or actually part of the decision making process, that's kind of unfair and sticks in the back of my throat a little bit. So I'm disappointed we're in a situation where we've got to take some quite uh, rapid measures. Um, but I think that these are, these are the measures we need. We need to review the organisation and come back with, with a, not a hastily written, but a speedy plan for what the new structure, what the uh, governance, what the let review, all of that encompasses. Now that comes back to this board. And if it's flawed and if it's failing, and if, 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 if I'm sure you'll have some issues with it, that's our chance to iron it out along the way. But I think that the time for action is now, not in three, six months' time, uh, with the naval gazing in on my side. Okay, Councillor Roberts. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just a couple of points really in, in response. And I support Steve's point. And I think that the key thing that comes out there is the uh, necessity to continue with our business at pace. Um, people move on. Organisations evolve. That's just natural. It's unsurprising. Um, all of the best organisations move on. All of the best organisations evolve. And many of the best do it at pace. This one does it at the pace. Now, I appreciate the difficulty that some members have with the out of their comfort zone and stale grinding 
bureaucracies that we often we often see in local government, um, and, and they struggle working and thinking outside of, 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 of those organisations. But we have to continue our business, and we have to continue its pace. The report that we're going to talk with, debate in the moment sets out, in my view, the best way forward. I, I can't support this amendment. Why would we waste many months? Why would we put things on hold, business as usual on hold, recruiting a temporary member of staff? Why would we do that when we have capable resource in house, absolutely capable of doing the job, carrying out the review, and then simultaneously we begin the process of recruiting permanent staff? The sooner this organisation has a permanent <coughs> in place, the more efficiently it will be able to operate. This is unsurprising. Let's just get on with it. Let's accept the, the, the report before us. I'm going to reject this amendment. I cannot support it. Let's get on. Continue with this as normal get a full time chief executive in place soon. Well, Councillor Herbert, um, just a couple of quick points. I mean, this is the place we decide things, Steve. Um, there may be informal discussions. Um, we got a paper on the 6th of September, um, which was our first discussion, and inadvertently it had got printed on it the 22nd of August. So a number of these proposals have been discussed and developed um, without any input from us, which is not unsurprising, um, and I take the fact that the Mayor is the leader. But we, as a combined authority, should um, uh, debate and discuss these and give our views. Um, in terms of how long it would take to appoint a suitable interim chief executive, um, it could be a week, it could be a month, but it, it would not be three months or six months. Um, clearly, um, what we haven't touched um, is, first of all, what is the um, uh, different roles of having two? Why two? And obviously that's an opportunity and an invitation, James, for you to say why. And second, uh, how long do we think it's going to be until we have a permit? Because this is purely a stop okay. uh, So we have no more speakers on the amendment. So I have no doubt that Councillor Roberts comments that some of us are functioning outside our comfort zone here is mentally offended and offensive and I am offended. Perhaps it is she, he who is outside his comfort zone by being asked to do what is best and not what is easy. And this paper proposes not what is easy, sorry, proposes what is easy, not what is best for our residents, what is best for the combined authority, and what is best for our staff by giving them stability, continuity, and the opportunity of expertise. So, gentlemen, it's time to do what's best, not what is easy, and that will deliver the best outcomes for us in the long run. Thank you, Councillor Smith. I'm slightly confused as to how we've heard many times over the course of the meeting that interim staff are not what we want. Again, the proposal is to bring an interim staff uh, chief executive in, but that's <coughs> quite confusing and misunderstanding. Uh, so we have a proposal and a second or an amendment. Do we have uh, all those in favour? Uh, those against? Thank you. So the amendment is lost. So we go back to, to debating this substantive motion. Uh, three speakers. Oh, I'll just ask some questions in the winding up. Um, I, I have not, it has not been made clear what the two roles are and, and what the focus is. Um, and that also feeds into the motion that we've got on the agenda later. Okay, so uh, in the discussions that we've had informally and privately, as you're, as you're aware, uh, Councillor Herbert, um, it, was, it was felt necessary for there to be continuity within the command authority. Uh, and uh, there was a feeling that Kim Soy would offer that continuity within the combined authority. It was felt that taking the time to go out uh, to, to, uh, uh, to appoint an interim chief executive would only delay the appointment of a chief executive, and it was felt that, that was an unnecessary waste of time. These points were all made uh, in the private meeting. Uh, John Hill was asked uh, to come along and help because of his experience in the organisation and because of his experience in, in restructuring. Uh, and again, this point was made in the private meeting where these decisions were discussed at me uh, and, uh, and decided on. So um, we are debating in public and it is right to debate in public. What we had to uh, debate at a matter as a matter of urgency <coughs> after the sudden resignation of Martin Whiteley. Um, and uh, 
I believe that uh, this debate is important to have this debate in public because there have been, uh, there has been misinformation, there has been wild speculation in the press, ill-informed wild uh, speculation in the press, uh, and I hope that this will uh, bring the matter to a close. So we have a recommendation uh, on, on before you. Uh, do I have a proposal? On the, uh, and a seconder. Councillor Seaton. All those in favour? Uh, those against? And abstentions. Thank you very much. Would uh, you like to ask uh, the Indian Chief Executive to please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, So we uh, move on to item 2.1 in the agenda, which is Council's housing strategy. Uh, I'd like to remind members that we're looking for the revised report appendix, which is the 19th of September. Uh, Council Brooks, I know that you are the newly appointed portfolio of the housing and the chair of the housing committee. Are you going to ask Roger Thompson, director of housing, to take us through the report? Thank you, Mayor. Yes, very happy to endorse this report for you today. It sets out the innovative, ambitious, new and bold strategies. Uh, to address with due urgency the undoubted shortage of housing uh, of all tenants across that combined region. So I hand over to Roger Thompson, who's the Combined Society's uh, permanent director of housing, to take us through the report and stimulate debate on the shore. So, Roger, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, well, our region has, uh, as a whole, has a strong and growing economy. Uh, housing markets are not providing enough new housing and specifically affordable housing. Uh, this lack of housing is identified as a serious threat to region's prosperity in this much a serious report. Um, the housing strategy proposed sets out the scope of our ambition to respond to that challenge. Uh, we are going to continue to offer uh, substantial grant based funding which we hope to motivate and inspire our partners at the housing agencies, developers, and the affordable housing providers to take advantage of the availability of that funding uh, and grants to increase and accelerate their schemes and programs. However, to make a difference and widen our impact on the market, we need to look beyond this grant and to other supplementary and dynamic tools, innovations, and propositions. The variety of tools available must be flexible enough to operate across the different local housing markets within a large property area across considerable life. And they also need to be capable of flexing in the future with the impact on the housing market the fluctuations in the national economy which can be significant and at times rapid. And so there's a possibility we might have one of these fluctuations in the next 24 months or so. The housing strategy maps these tools out. We propose to intervene directly using innovative skills and structures to invest in the delivery of housing schemes where that investment may be recycled. That money can then be reinvested into more housing schemes in the future from a, revolve, sorry, from a revolving fund. This will offer a legacy of housing schemes in the future from the original £100 million fund that the government has made available for schemes outside of Cambridge City. Supporting new development both up to 2022. I recommend the discussion to the Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Singley, you, uh, you've got some points from scrutiny. I think most of the matters you probably dealt with by uh, Councillor Sargent in his, uh, in his uh, opening uh, questions, but perhaps you can answer those to the work. Thank you. I think it's important to recognise that Councillor Sargent's comments were made by Councillor Sargent, whereas the comments that I'm bringing have the backing of the whole scrutiny committee, and therefore there's a, a difference in the way that... Um, that uh, so I think we shouldn't assume that Councillor Sargent's comments are the same. Okay, so I just... Obviously, Councillor Sargent is a member of the scrutiny. Yes, absolutely. But, but the comments that he made, he made in his role as a member of the public, whereas these oh, are comments okay. that come with the backing of the entire scrutiny. My mistake, I thought he was a councillor. Yes, yeah. um, so first of all, um, the first point that is, is a kind of general point, which, which is the same as the one made by the council 
Sergeant, but it, it, again, it was it, this comes from the whole committee that that um, there wasn't a, um, a disappointment with the standard of report in comparison with some of the other reports that have been received by the scrutiny uh, by the by authority. Um, and in particular, one of the things that the scrutiny committee was not happy about was that the report didn't appear to be. Um, focused entirely on the Cambridge of Peterborough area. Um, in, a, in particular, there were references in there to West Sussex, or was it West Sussex, I think, um, which made it appear that this was a much more generic report than some of the other ones that have been accepted by the Northern Authority in the past. Uh, that's a comment. So the other things that, um, that we wanted, uh, the first one is absolutely a question. The questions that we had in the last debate were not fully really answered. So the, the question that we asked about, um, about it, whether or not the two new members of the chief executive were the full time part time, that was not answered. So we wrote it to this quickly. Um, the committee would like to see. Sorry, that's sorry, Councillor Singh. I thought you were meant to talk about the housing. Yes, I am. So I would, but I would like an answer to the question. But, but we are talking about housing. Yes, there. and this is a housing okay. question. I'd like okay. an answer to the question. So the committee would like to seek assurances on whether or not the hundred million pounds for housing is being allocated as the government intended, to be, intended it to be under the devolution deal. And the second question, which is a more general one and you may not be able to answer quite so precisely, is whether or not the combined authority is achieving additionality from the way it has spent its housing money in the past and whether or not it will do in the future. So those are two quite specific questions. Thank you very much. Um, um, so I'm just going to be Roger in on those two questions, if, if I can. Uh, and if we can't answer now, we will sort of start talking to you. Um, is there a, a, a additional answer? Yes. Um, and so the first question was on whether or not the, the way the money is being spent is in, in line with the way it was intended in the devolution deal. Okay, I, I, well, I believe so because it's, it's all going to be put towards delivering housing or housing in the combined stock area. We're suggesting that. We, we sort of uh, taking a flexible approach rather than just offering the 100 million pounds as grant only, that we're trying to apply these other tools to offer a more sort of diverse approach to the market, which will enable us maybe to actually accelerate and create some additional units otherwise. I don't think you're, creating, you're just looking at grant only. Well, I think there were questions about whether or not that will allow the money to be... Well, I think, um, Councillor Singer, the devolution deal was very, very clear in its support communities and trust housing. Uh, and this report is very, very clear in its uh, support community and housing. Uh, the idea of the 40 million is to revolve funding. So rather than spend 100 million and whistle and hope we have a kiss support from the government, we can give a rolling fund of 40 million that will continue to be repaid and we can continue to invest in future housing. So creating significantly more housing than just spending our money uh, straight out and hoping government provide us with more if we go and ask them. So we think it's a, a more rounded approach uh, that will create more opportunities to create more housing. And, and the reality is, uh, and I'll say this to the public, I've said it many, many times, the status quo is not providing the houses we need to solve our housing crisis. The whole system is set up to stop delivery of housing. And the, the, the reality is, if it wasn't set up to stop delivery of housing, if the status quo was working, we wouldn't have a housing crisis. So we have to be innovative. We have to look outside of the natural framework of the 40-60 split, which isn't serving our population. And we have to create housing that our young people can afford to live in. Because there's absolutely no doubt whatsoever that the current systems in place are not allowing young people the choice that people of my generation have. And we have to do something substantial about that. That's why we don't want to blow all of our money on housing association grant. That's why we're creating a 40 million fund that's revolving. And that's why we think that it's a significant enhancement on what we can achieve with the money that the government gave us. So the question from the scrutiny committee is, is that in line with the deviation? I think it goes way above the deviation deal. Uh, the, uh, the, we, we believe that with this rolling fund we can create significantly more money, significantly more houses uh, than the, uh, the devolution deal suggested. And we will continue to create significantly more houses than the devolution deal suggests. So you're suggesting it's significantly different from what was in the I'm, I'm saying it's in, in, incredibly better. It's a greater opportunity. It's re reusing by loan funding and, and increasing the amount that, that I mean, the 40 million pounds 
could be re revolving for a number of decades. There is no real reason why it couldn't do that. And we could be still to people in my position, people in my position, not me, could be speaking in 10, 15 years' time about still reusing that £40 million. Pounds. <coughs> We'd spend every single penny of the £100 million pounds on grant funding uh, for housing associations, that money would be gone within two years. But it would I want provide something different. Sorry? It would provide something different. It would provide a different no, type it, of no, housing. No, I totally disagree with that, Cecilia. It would provide more of the same. It would provide more housing that people can't afford to live in. It would provide more device, device of housing for the, the communities that we have. We still have, we still have the problem that we have with people being forced into private rent that, uh, that, 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 uh, that we have currently. We would still have the problem around affordability of, of market housing. And we would still have the issues that we have across the entirety of the county with people not being able to get into the market. Uh, and, and the old system, the 60-40 split, the Housing Association 40 percent is not delivering for the people of our county. It hasn't been delivering for the last 15 years, and it's not going to deliver for the next 25 years. And unless we open our minds, and unless we cr try and create a better way, we will still be suffering the same problems that we're discussing now, in 10 years' time, but they will be more acute. And so we have to do things better than just literally giving housing associations millions of pounds to create what the numbers they used to. Um, Councillor Hogan. Um, I, I want to make a few comments but also move uh, um, an amendment on this item. Um, I, I do so taking the point that in using the £100 million grant from government that we have to um, make the absolute best of it. And I'm perfectly up for loaning um, and uh, grants. But I, I do sense and I've heard a sort of negativity about housing associations, which I just feel is unfair. Um, and they are the primary deliverer of affordable housing, particularly affordable housing for rent. So in terms of just uh, stating the amendment, um, uh, uh, I think, and I, I believe I'm, uh, it's a joint effort with Councillor Smith, um, that keeping one single hundred million pounds pot is the right approach. Um, and the concern, if we look at the way that recommendation is worded, is that the uh, recommendation B is one of the woolliest recommendations I've seen in my uh, 20 years as a councillor. Um, where it says agreed concept of creating a revolving fund of monies. Now, it doesn't say what it's for or how it's going to be used. Um, there is a thread in this report, though there's a lack of thread because it's a housing strategy, there's a lack of thread in both the report and the report commissioned by consultants about what is affordable housing. So, uh, we're I want to move that we delete recommendation B, but we just uh, and instead agree, uh, replace with agrees the total allocation of the 100 million capital grant is kept in a single pot effectively to deliver at least 2,000 um, homes over five years. So this is. And sorry, this, so can, can you repeat that? Sorry. sorry. Uh, um, so please. basically, delete recommendation B, replace it, agrees the total allocation of the 100 million pound capital grant. Um, is, is to deliver at least uh, 2,000 homes over five years. So keep, the effect of that is to keep it as a, uh, a single pocket. Um, now, in terms of the um, devolution deal that we all signed up to, um, and this is covered also by the fact that if we are to make changes to it, it specifically says in clause one of the devolution deal that all of the members of the combined authority should agree to it. Um, if we actually look at the wording that we signed up to but in paragraph 20, um, yes, it said at least 2,000 affordable homes, but there's, that's, there's no maximum in that. What it did say, and this is where I'm concerned about um, the wording of the report and also the lack of focus on affordability by the consultants, is it specifically says that the fund would be subject to a business case, and I underline the next words, targeted at areas with the most significant affordability challenges, which is why we raised the issue of the affordability assessment in March 2017, which said that 45% of that lack of affordability was in uh, Greater Cambridge, and 25% was actually in Peterborough. So two uh, or three council areas have got 70% of the assessed affordability challenge. 
And that is written, James, um, there into uh, the devolution deal that we've agreed to. And that's why that part is, is really important. Now, if we look, and we have got ambitions um, to build a lot more homes, but if we look at the report that we've got, which is effectively proposed to us as being our housing strategy, there is nothing about the affordability, really of any significance of the affordability challenges. There is a recognition on a page which is unnumbered, but um, paragraph uh, 1.3.1 um, and a map, which shows that we've got three different economies and we've also got three different affordability areas. And it is not the case that I believe that we can deliver things like a £100,000 home in either Cambridge or South Cambridgeshire. And it is the case that people, even on average incomes in Greater Cambridge and in much of the rest of our geography, um, can only afford to rent. And that's why um, uh, this strategy doesn't have anything about that kind of aspect, that income and affordability of homes um, dictate to us that we really do need to just stick at affordable housing. And I personally, I, I, I don't know why it's a tact that um, uh, affordable housing is de delivered as part of bigger schemes, because that has been the primary way that this has been delivered. So that's the amendment, is just to keep it as a £100,000 home uh, fund. Um, in talking to housing associations, they're finding it really difficult to get money out of this uh, combined authority really difficult um, and I don't believe a single housing association home has yet been funded I, I can be uh, uh, quite happily corrected on that um, and if you look at the spending um, plan which is in paragraph 331 um, on the, think about the seventh page of the covering report I believe it's a wholly optimistic even on the 60 million and my understanding of the complexities of delivering these projects I just believe that's a wholly optimistic spread. Um, so how much has actually been paid to housing associations so far? Have there been homes built? Um, uh, given that we've got a deadline of 2021-2022, I make the same points I made at the Combined Authority Board back in February, which is that we really have to know by 2019-2020 and that all of this money has already been allocated. I understand that they're signing up to contracts which say that unless they've actually started on site, we won't pay them. We may not pay them a penny. I'm seriously concerned um, that we're not focusing enough on the core delivery, um, and that's part of the reason for this amendment, including inserting new clauses such as clawback um, or overage requirements into the um, uh, into uh, reports which say that if a housing association makes more money than they expect, they'll have to pay it back. Finally, um, we are in an environment where the government of the Bank of England has said that house prices could fall by up to 30 or 40 percent. Um, and there is a severe risk to housing associations going into these schemes at the moment. I don't think we should be putting negative clauses in. Thank you. Okay, uh, seconded. Councillor Smith, uh, you want to speak now or do you want to hold um, You can speak now. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. So, well, no doubt I'll be the only other person that's usually supporting this, but um, they know. Um, this is indeed, as uh, scrutiny of you have pointed out, and as Councillor Herbert has pointed out, a poor, poor report. The £100 million pounds came from the Homes and Communities uh, HCA budget on the basis that local people make better decisions about spending money locally. And it was quite clear that it was to be allocated on the grounds of need, and that need assessed on the grounds of affordability. And actually, when we come to the gateway review for how that money was spent, and I gather that uh, there were people at the HCA who were none too pleased about having to relinquish this money, and the Melody Dawes made it quite clear what it was to be used for. And when we come to the gateway review, if it transpired that it hasn't been spent as agreed, actually, I think we're in trouble, quite honestly. Going to the report itself, the poorly written report. If we look at 3.34. So, uh, 
sorry, on page um, 319. He says, ensuring a reasonable geographic spread of schemes throughout the combined authority area, previous data on need indicated that every part of the combined authority area currently has a need. Well, I mean, that's a vacuous statement in the extreme. Of course we all have need, but we all have different sorts of need. And the SPEAR report, which was funded largely by this body, quite clearly shows that people working in Cambridge City and in Peterborough cannot afford to live near their workplace. And so they're having to live in the furthest reaches and beyond of Cambridgeshire with the economic impact of the commuting costs of that and the health and well-being impact of spending large parts of their lives commuting in what can be terrifying <coughs> traffic, particularly when you get out to, out to Finland. So, you know, we all have need, but we cannot deny that different areas have different needs, particularly when it comes to affordability, which is what we're meant to be basing this on. When we come to 4.2 on page 320, it says to use approximately, approximately, what does that mean? £60 million and £100 million programme funds to deliver the target of 2,000 affordable homes. Now, it was not a target, it was a minimum. And you know, when we discussed it, this in the informal meeting, I said we cannot call it a target because that is not what's in the deal. It was a minimum of £2,000, so let's at least get basic words like that correct. So ha what I fail to understand is when the deal was signed and the £100 million was negotiated, it was negotiated because £100 million was needed to deliver a minimum of 2,000 additional affordable homes. So how on earth can we now say that we're going to do that with approximately 60 million? It just doesn't stack up. Excuse my simplistic view of this. But how come, you know, two months ago we knew it was going to cost 100 million pounds, and now we're saying it's going to cost 60 million pounds? It just does not make sense. So we cannot ignore the impact of this, the Sphere report in this. You know, please let's honour the original devolution, uh, devolution agreement. Let's not shortchange residents of Peterborough, residents of Greater Cambridgeshire, by defaulting on the original deal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please and Prime Minister Engelman. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, two, two very quick questions um, from my point of view. Uh, number one is how the combined authority will be monitoring added value. So how will it prove that the investment has brought forward uh, growth um, that isn't already organic? Um, so that, that's um, how that's going to do that, I'd be interested in. Uh, and the other thing in an accelerated um, uh, growth position is how the combined authority will ensure that public services are already stretched are able to deliver services to that growth and can meet uh, that growth potential as well. Um, on the second point, uh, Peter Parker, Mr. White, I'd be quite happy to join you in government to discuss fair funding uh, for the police uh, as we are proposing with the uh, uh, public sector reform of uh, health and social care as well. Now, on the first point, it's a technical question that I have the answer for. I wonder if uh, Roger, if you can make first question. Um, yes, to, to agree with you, uh, Mr. Matt. Um, obviously, we'll be recording the, the delivery of the housing units themselves. Um, there, there will be obviously some sort of economic impact to that. There will be obviously economic impact on the spend in terms of the construction spend that will be taking place and we're trying to encourage that spend to be with uh, local uh, contractors where, where possible. Although we can't guarantee that we're trying to encourage them. Um, and then there'll be the wider economic impact um, which sort of steers us to refer to again in terms of the wider area and the economic benefits of the whole region of creating those additional houses that will result in employers being able to bring their people here and employ them in the region. Okay. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Uh, there you are. Just speaking to the amendment at this point in time. Um, so there's two parts really that I see in the amendment. One is we've got £100 million for the lever, £100 million for the 
a single part and the, and the second point is whether it sticks to the original configuration theory. So, absolutely clear on this, this is sticking to the original devolution deal. The right? original devolution deal was to deliver a minimum of 2,000 homes or 100 million pounds, and it is. The fact that we're putting one label and one use on 40 million and one label and one use on 60 million, and that label is flexible as well, it's built in, in order to, de de devolve a, 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 to get a revolving home, does not mean any of the money is not being spent on affordable housing. It does not mean that it's being taken somewhere else. It is purely and simply to deliver those 2,000 homes and more at speed and to create a firm where we can continue doing that into the future. So it's in line with the deal. It's a better use of 100 million pounds going out the door in grant funding. Now, at the, at the very start, when we were talking about a very early session, an informal session, so where we had housing strategy meetings, everybody in the room agreed that we should try and get some kind of revolving fund. I'm sure you did, Lewis, and I think it was Peter before you, and I'm sure it did, that the basic principle was if we could get some of the money to revolve, it would be better in the long term. Now, if we carry on doing a £100 million grant, we'll never have that. Now, that, that revolving uh, fund and the grant fund is not particular to any area. It's to deliver at speed. The biggest problem I see is not who's got the most need. It's how do we get the foundations out of the ground in time to meet the government gateways. And that's the most important thing at the moment, is to build houses at speed. So if we do some with a, with a rolling fund, that'd be even better. So that's the biggest difficulty. At this present point in time, not every authority is submitting schemes that are actually even eligible for grant. So I think the worst thing the worst thing we saw those people do is leave £100 million pounds in one pot, carve it up by the area and have one lot of money sitting in the bank waiting for the day that everybody's able to bring forward schemes that may or may, may not hit, hit the government for review for when the foundations have not been out of hand. The most important thing for this area is to build houses. And this housing strategy absolutely delivers that in line with the demolition deal. So I see this amendment uh, a little bit more than time continuing to be on this, and I'll be uh, voting against it. Councillor Hollidge. Yeah, I mean, thank you for has been mentioned, so I hope to thank you. I think uh, we were first in the debate, and I think you and I went and dug the first uh, poll of, mm -hmm. of, of in Penbra, and they are being delivered by a joint venture between the Trustees and the Sixth Company. Uh, and that's now been approved, and there's a lot more in the pipeline, uh, 135 homes, which is costing not much more over a million. Uh, but because we're adding additionality to, uh, to this, because until we get our development plan uh, approved by, by the government, we can't go in here land that isn't uh, already in the hands of builders and whatever have you. So we're, we're buying a, a bit of the road one. Uh, which uh, I hope you will uh, appreciate it. it it's, it's a month late now, but next uh, next uh, uh, month should bring up bring us up 29 houses, which we bought straight off the of, of builder with your assistance to get uh, the additionality in there so they'll all be rented. So, yeah, it's a bit in the mix, but I think it's going to be difficult if you do it that way. You spend about 25 million at this point in time. And, you, 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 you talk about clawback in here. If you, you can put a bid in, but if you can't deliver it, you're depriving others. So I think you do need to keep a, 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 a holistic approach to it, where you, you're thinking, well, are you going to deliver more? Are you going to start on fire? Are you? Because it's not the government saying to us on the big revolution deal, don't come back for more money, you can, you can deliver it. And don't come back in a pipeline, deliver it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we're trying to do. Absolutely. Any more speakers on the agenda? Councillor Roberts. No, just really picking up on Councillor's point and, and wanting to try and um, broaden the thinking a little bit on this because I, I just can't accept um, this definition of need in great, being greater in one area than, than in another. You know, you seem to be uh, promoting just doing what you've always done and getting what you've always got. You know, pumping cash in the form of grant to housing associations. And worse than that, you seem to be promoting doing that only in Cambridge and Peterborough. What about the displacement cycle? How are you going to ensure that all these houses, that the housing associations are miraculously going to come forward and spend the grant and deliver? 
very difficult which they haven't done in the past. How are you going to make sure that people living in Cambridge are actually living in those, and that actually people aren't displaced from elsewhere? And we need to understand the impact of the high salaries in Cambridge, where you said there's a greater gap, there's a greater need. Well, the effect of that is, of course, that people move out of Cambridge and they move out of the patch that I represent in East Cambridgeshire and beyond towards Fenland, moving for the, for, for the cheaper property. So actually the impact, you know, the impact is across the area. So actually there's an affordability crisis across the place. To say it's greater in one area than in another. And until you actually start linking availability of property to place of work, you won't break that cycle. So you've got to be more innovative. You've got to do things differently. You have to think outside the box. If you carry on doing what you've just done, you will not solve the crisis. So we have a, a proposer and a seconder for the amendment. Uh, all those in favour? Uh, those against? Thank you. Uh, so we go back to make a substantial motion. Any other proposals? We've obviously given it quite a good uh, discussion. This we to come back. Well, it's just to uh, ask the questions I've asked. I mean, um, I, I, um, I disagreed with your challenge to the strategy that was being developed by Councillor Topping and by um, our advisors. Um, I do think that we need to re-establish strong relationships with housing associations and I think um, there needs to be proper dialogue, James, because I think they've lost confidence in us. Um, and I would like us to uh, evidence, um, and I'd really like just Roger's answer to my questions, particularly in relation to the table. Um, uh, how much have we spent so far? Um, uh, uh, can, uh, can he say that the housing associations um, are signing up? Um, are how many contracts with them have not yet been signed? And, and how, Roger, do you think that this spending pattern will ensure that we aren't left um, with egg on our face in 2022 because we haven't spent the money? So, Roger, would you take those questions away and give a written response to Councillor? Well, I'd like some response, Mayor. Well, I don't know if you have a response to that. Uh, I, I think there's some response to, to part of it and good response to it. Um, in terms of the um, schemes that have been through board that have not yet been signed, I believe there are approximately four of those. Um, they are for a variety of reasons. For example, at North Stowe, there's the uh, infrastructure improvement for the drainage works in phase two. Now, they are tendering that work at the moment. That won't be signed before I think early next year for the time that documentation is really ready for us to consider. Um, the schema, uh, again, passing through the passive reserve, that is pending at the moment, and actually being frank, that is on risk at the moment because there's an issue with the access to that site, uh, and, and therefore there's an issue with the uh, providers that are not wanting to take the site without that access issue being resolved. Um, there are other issues, like with the other couple of cases as well, which we're trying to help the providers work through, because we obviously want to see these schemes come forward, so we're offering other assistance where we can, but we are not in control. They are in control of these situations, and we're here to try and offer the grant uh, when they need it and when they're ready for it. Uh, we are having discussions with uh, a variety of the housing providers, so we're talking to them, there's the likes of the uh, new startup Ever. Uh, well, we've had two meetings with them, I mean, they're launching, I think, um, the they're launch, but they're launching early in November. Um, and we've offered uh, assistance, so we've been we highly welcome any opportunities to get involved with their schemes and have them to the houses throughout the region. Um, so, you know, I think we are there, we are trying to engage with the, just a bit of awareness, I think the 60 million number is sort of driven by our estimation of what we think to get to at least, and we said at least an act for actually 2,000 units. Um, we think it will take to get to the 2,000 number because the average rate we're seeing the like of, of grant application at the moment from the 280 of units that we've approved is about 30,000 pounds. And looking at what we see potentially in the hopper coming downstream, do I think that's going to change? Actually, I'm hoping that that will be sustainable and that brings us to 60 million for the 2,000 units, which then brings us to the ability to do more with the money. That's largely what this report is about. So we have our 40 million pounds, we want to try and do more with them. On the table, I think under section 331 in the report, I'm suggesting we're going to try and outperform and get to two and a half thousand units. 
That's what I'm suggesting the strategy is going to try and do. Because we're going to engage the market and do a whole diverse range of stuff that is way beyond just waiting for uh, all the providers to do the grant application. That's my ambition. I'd like to think that people would share that ambition. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Um, perhaps if you want to come back for a while. Uh, yes. So, gentlemen, let's just be absolutely clear what we're approving today. What we're approving is a first-come, first-served approach to this money, which does not reference need or where our money will be best spent. And that's not acceptable. You referenced North Stone. So in places like South Cambridgeshire, we are not completely in control of our own destiny. There are other agencies, such as Homes England, you know, whose, whose mercy we are at, because we are not in a position to put forward schemes that desperately need combined authority funding because other agencies are, you know, still have work to do. So you know, we cannot put things forward prematurely before we are confident that they are ready to go. So it might be that life is a bit simpler in other parts of Cambridgeshire and people are talking about smaller schemes which they have far more control over. So you know, what you're doing here is creating a system that is potentially unfair to those of us with much more complex situations as far as delivering housing is concerned. So I can, can I just finish please? So I cannot support something that talks about ensuring a reasonable geographic spread with absolutely no explanation about what reasonable means and when there is absolutely no explanation about what need means either. You know, what we are what you are approving here is first come, first serve. You get your applications in first, this is all about you know hitting your two and a half thousand target as quickly as possible. So the combined authority has said we've spent the money, we've built X number of houses without the assurance that those houses are where they are really, really going to benefit the people who are really struggling in Cambridgeshire and Peterborough. Can I respond to some couple of points? Thank you. Um, at uh, uh, North Stow, there is a, a third place in North Stow, which I think most people are aware of, which actually is a much more sort of significant scheme as the sort of centre of North Stow. We are in regular communication with Homes England about um, their process in delivering those homes, which is um, sort of an ongoing exercise, but the centenary going on, and, and, and there'll be, I think, a more certain outcome next year. We are uh, provisionally committing to, to Homes England. Um, quite a significant contribution. We've sort of penciled that in because that dialogue has been ongoing. Please tell me about it. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, I'm very happy to do so. I think I'll be aware of it, but if not, I will brief her appropriately. Um, on, on a separate issue, just around stuff on South Cambridgeshire, um, to be honest, I, 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 we, we are after sort of the information of what's in the, what's in the pipeline and what's coming in. We're getting some of that, but I, I, I'm not at the moment seeing a huge amount coming through. The one scheme we have, which hopefully is going to come to the board in the next month or two, has actually come direct from the Affordable Housing Provider, who's approached us. And it looks like a great scheme. I'm going to be delighted to recommend it to the board hopefully in the next couple of months and support that. And that will come to Housing Committee, uh, I think, uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Um, so if you're feeling as if we're sort of ignoring you. I'm trying to reassure you we're not. Um, and you know, we, we're articulating sort of the process that we want to spread it across the board as, as per the strategy. I think what I'm saying is it's not a level playing field and I, I need confidence that you are aware that we are not all functioning on a level playing field. Well, okay, but I mean, I, I, yeah, I have been asked for some information from South Cambridge as well about some of your strategic sites, for example, and I've offered to help. And actually, at this moment in time, I've had no response to that. Okay, well, can so you I, can't, I can't make that up. You only need to respond to that. Okay, can, can, we, can, can we can perhaps, um, perhaps councillors did uh, uh, perhaps we can recommend okay. a conversation with, with Roger and uh, your chief executive. Okay. Uh, and uh, maybe some sites would potentially come through for South Cambridge who may then be able to react to those. Um, Councillor Count. Yeah, may maybe I want to talk about uh, two items that have been commented on earlier on the, the clawback clause and the speed of delivery. Um, and, and I won't veer into the, what, what is obviously keeping money in the bank again until we get ready at two. Um, so the clawback one, I, I cannot get my head around why anybody complains about this. 
why this would delay a housing association from coming forward. The clawback. I'm, I'm going to try and put this as simply as people uh, as, as people can manage. If, if my son once upon a time said to me, I'm starting a new job in, in Timbuktu and I need £100,000 to, to buy a house, and through luck, straightening it together or getting the mortgage out myself, I go, here you go, son, have £100,000. He says, thanks, Dad. And then he comes back home the next day and he says, you know what, because I had £100,000 ready, I got it for ninety-five grand. I'm that good. And I go, well, that's nice. And he shakes my hand. And that's where we are at the moment. We give money to housing providers on the basis of the figures that they give us. They supply the figures. They tell us what the um, figures are going to be at the end of the model. And I said, if those figures change over the period of time of delivery so that it is better, then instead of just giving them £100,000, they do it for £95,000 and simply shake your hand and walk over the five grand difference, you come to an arrangement as to what would be the share afterwards. So we're not asking for everything back. It's in the documentation. It's a, it's, it's, it's a share. So what we're saying to the housing providers are, if the figures improve over the period of time from where you were prepared to take a risk, it would be good if we could share the rewards so that we can supply money back to yourself and another housing provider at future dates. And you actually have an incentive to improve on the figures you first substitute. So how anyone can argue about that, my head must be screwed on this. It really will. Because it's something I've argued for from the start. It's as plain as how, so it's very plain to me to see how that works. And I cannot understand why a housing provider would be put off coming forward with that plan. Because the only time the clawback clause operates is if their position is better off than the one that they're willing to do business on. So, so I'm spying on that one. Um, so I'm glad I've argued for that, and I'm glad uh, that, that, that it's gone in the document and I'll be supporting that particular Now the other one is the, is the delivery on time. So I've mentioned earlier on in the debate, we actually have to get the foundations out of around by 21, 22. So whoever we give money to, we're only entitled to give that money over if the foundations come out of the ground. They don't qualify it if not. So somebody says to us, we can build at this price, we can deliver at that speed. We say, fair enough, here's the money. But we say, remember, we now say, in court of the document, the outcome of our, you have to deliver by this timetable. Because if not, we're not entitled to have given you that money. So it's totally reasonable for us to introduce that clause, to not have it. It's actually poor governance and absolutely irresponsible with public money. And again, I cannot understand why people have propped up an argument against that when it's very plain and simple to see what we want and why we need it. So an example of that happening would be if there is suddenly a crash in the market and somebody is two thirds of the way through building, right? They then have an option of to actually stagnate building and sit on it for 10 years at the moment. But if we put the grants in in this way, that option, they will know that if they choose to do that, the first thing they have to do is return the money that they took risk with. So they're much more likely to complete. So those two clauses which are introduced, I, I do not understand why people are using them. They make, for me, they make sense to the common man and woman. And, and I cannot understand how you can complicate those issues so they cannot be uh, both for. Thank you. Do you speak okay. again? I, yeah, I'd just like to ask a question, please. Yes. That's something we haven't covered. Uh, on page 321, uh, could you please um, explain to me, 5.1 says that the implementation of the housing strategy will require the, to the creation of a combined authority DEVCO and potential subsidi sub subsidiary companies. Could you just explain sure. to me yeah. why yeah. we need to do that? Okay. If we um, go back to the toolbox, actually, just look after concession 3.27 and 3.28, um, we're indicating there some of the potential um, tools that we might use other than traditional grant modeling to deliver some of the additional housing. Um, we will need to have some entities created in order to be able to undertake those functions. So, um, for example, if we're going to move into a joint venture with a party, we need a vehicle, a company that will enter into that joint venture. So that might be combined authority, one in the or something. Um, 
we can't enter into them as I understand that as a combined authority. We have to have some vehicles within that. So the, the, there's some work going on at the moment around how this might work. But the principle, I think, is that there'll probably be some sort of lean combined authority debt for a company. And there may be some subsidiary companies, possibly, that sit underneath that, but the undertaking particular function. We just want to manage the reason. And that will come back to board, I think, when we have some of these proposals uh, for you to sort of uh, have awareness of them and to approve them. Councillor uh, Just on that, Arne, I just wanted to confirm that in the original devolution document, this uh, uh, in the introduction of the debt code, is actually in that devolution document that we all signed up to. Okay, so no further speakers. I'll just uh, I'll bring a couple of things in here. I think, first of all, uh, Councillor Herbert, 60% of the money we're proposing is okay. going to housing associations. This is ignoring what the housing associations do. They have a part to play absolutely in the development of housing in our, in our county and of course nationally as well. The question is, is the current system working for the people of our county? And I don't think any of us can say that it is. So we have to do something better. We have to be more original in our thinking. There seems to be some kind of misunderstanding of the opportunity here. Um, the community land trust system works brilliantly anywhere, but the more valuable the land, the more trust houses can be created at no cost to the taxpayer, and those houses are rented out at a lower rate, typically, than uh, association houses. It's a different system. It takes the opportunity you've got to take a bigger head around it, and you've got to look at think outside the box, and yes, you have to build outside the planning envelope to do so. But the reality is, there has to be an honest conversation with the electorate of Cambridgeshire. We cannot continue to pretend to the people of Cambridgeshire that we will stop housing. We cannot continue to pretend to the people of Cambridgeshire that we, as councillors or as elected representatives, don't have the ability to build more housing. That's being dishonest to the voters of today and it's being dishonest to the voters of tomorrow. Simply burying our head on us in the sand and saying, we're doing okay, so let's forget about the rest of you, is not good enough. And the current situation isn't doing the job for the majority of people in our county or in the country. Now, it's not just ourselves we have to look at as local councils and local representatives. How can we up our game? How can we be more honest with the general public? This is a challenge for national government as well. And they've got to get their heads out of the Brexit deal, whatever party they are, and look at the biggest crisis facing this country, which is the housing crisis. And if we don't get a grip of it, we will still be having the same conversations, as I said earlier to the, the chairman of the overview and scrutiny, we'll be having the same conversations in 10, 15 years' time. It is absolutely immoral that the only people that can afford to buy a house in this country are the people who already have one, or who can give the money to their children to allow them to do so. That's why the 100k house is in this policy, and that is affordable. <coughs> you ask for a definition of affordable, Councillor Herbert, three times your wage is affordable. If you have a partner and you are on minimum wage, three times your wage is 100k. That's why we've gone for a 100k house as an option to deliver a better opportunity for the people of this county. And yes, you can build houses for 100 grand. You can build them in South Downs or anywhere through land land you capture. So with the garden village principle that we have, through community land trusts, through housing associations, and through market housing, we have to do something better. I believe that this paper absolutely lifts the opportunity for the young people in this county, and for everybody in this county, to take part in what is an incredible economy. And if we just throw it out, because it's not what we've always done, or it might not be suitable because housing associations don't like it, we are absolutely being dishonest to the taxpayer. So I recommend this paper. I think it's been excellently written, excellently put together. It's one of the best papers we've had since we've had mine authority. And I'm very grateful to Roger for putting it together. And I urge you all to put down and put away your, your, your uh, antagonism and vote in favour of creating housing for local people. Uh, so, all those in favour. Uh, and those against? And abstentions. The next item on the agenda is uh, again on the uh, housing uh, programme, and this is uh, uh, 
in Cambridge this time with their £70 million pounds part of the evolution deal, and, and Roger, I'd like you to do this for this paper is a follow-up to the uh, program up that paper that went to board on, in July around the 70 million uh, Cambridge City uh, for the housing program. Uh, it is a request for budget approval for that program for this financial year. Uh, just to remind the program is delivering 500 affordable units from a 70 million pound uh, um, budget allocation. Um, the paper has a lot of financial process, two parts really. Uh, one part is to request the approval to carry forward monies from the previously approved 1718 budget um, that wasn't called for by the city council during that year. That sums approximately £307,000. And the second part is the approval of the budget for 1819, um, which, as indicated, I think in Appendix 1 of the, the report, comes to approximately £14.6 million. Pounds. The major item in uh, the budget for this year is, uh, as reported in July, the acquisition of the Sanitas from a road. Uh, our process behind this is, is that um, once the board approves, we have our own financial process that Carl is, is administering around the application for those monies to our system, which comes through the housing team and through the finance team. Thank you. Speakers? Uh, just a brief comment, and that is that what the report also says, in, that says two things. One, it shows that we're bringing forward a profile of that spend, which has been helped by acquisitions of land and also the planning commissions, including a couple subject to planning committee decisions next year. And the appendix also evidences the detailed sites on which it's been spent. So, and um, we're obviously very happy just to keep updating the combined quality of progress. Um, and we are pretty close to starting to put the foundations in um, at uh, the first major site, which is a final road back Thank you very much. Any further comments? Uh, so, I'm going to go to the first one, the first and the second one. Uh, Councillor Paul. Uh, so, what is in favour? Uh, we're now going to the uh, paper on public service reform. Uh, Paul Reyes, welcome to the table. The devolution deal had a commitment uh, uh, to uh, uh, health, uh, uh, public sector reform, and health and social care reform, and uh, Paul is going to update us on our progress so far. Um, thank you, Matt. Um, as you say, paragraph 62 of the devolution deal contains quite a wide range of uh, commitment to work on uh, what's described as innovative and integrated approaches to redesigning sustainable public services across the industry and in with a focus on prevention of early health. And the following paragraphs then focus us particularly um, on health and social care. So this paper is about how we're taking that uh, commitment forward. Um, it's very obvious why health and social care should be an area of focus in the public service reform and nationally. That is a part of the system that is under stress. Locally, our health economy is one of the more, more one of the most challenged uh, in the country. Uh, the local government uh, care system is also facing very significant uh, financial challenges. Um, but obviously, this is something that is really quite hard to do. Tools for doing uh, health and care integration were in the Health and Care Act of 1999 and other devolution deals in London and Manchester and uh, Cornwall uh, have contained commitments around health and social care, but actually making it happen um, is not straightforward. Um, the way forward um, we have taken, um, and obviously a lot of this is work uh, that was done uh, by excellent colleagues uh, before I came on the scene, um, in line with our overall business model, rather than trying to build a capability within the combined authority, we look to get expert support uh, from outside, um, and the, the, the course, the process we went through in order to retain uh, the services of this public and uh, an independent think tank. Um, uh, the paper also records the budget set aside for that, and also for other activity in this year on the wider public service reform uh, front. Uh, the timeline for taking this work forward 
um, involves a lot of engagement uh, with health departments usually working with the CCG, the uh, SCP, which is the Sustainability and Transformation Partnership, which is chaired by the chair of the Lincolnshire in the University Hospitals Trust, um, and other health partners, Director for Public Health and so on. Um, we are looking to see a report coming uh, to the combining authority around about the end of the year so that we should be able to bring something to you on the timeline here um, in January. Um, that would then allow us to work together with partners to put together a further devolution bid um, in the early part of next year, which would contain both evidence, and I know that our expenditure is working very hard on the evidence base, um, but also some concrete asks that we might put together through next year. Um, the paper also uh, notes the establishment of an independent commission on public service reform, which is to be chaired by uh, Andy Wood, uh, who you may come across as the chief executive of Adlam, so he's also the author of a textual government management and innovation. Um, he has put together um, a commission uh, with all his own invitees recently involved in recruiting, um, uh, which has, let's go back to the earlier conversation, which has a uh, very good gender balance, uh, as well as expertise at both the national level and in our local area. Um, the first task in terms of reference set out in the paper for that commission will be to work with the Health and Social Care Project but then we will be looking to them to explore the wider issues um, about evolution of the public service reform through the early part of next year. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Um, I, I really welcome this. This was what some of us um, wanted as part of the evolution we wanted to tackle um, huge challenges in social care and health. Um, skills, um, worklessness, um, and often also issues in disadvantaged areas and communities where we're not uh, spending money well. But just to take the question of this um, planned um, public um, sector reform commission, um, I just ask if um, uh, Paul Rains can tell us a bit more because we haven't had any proposal about the membership or the funding for this commission. So uh, can you say what the budget is for the Commission and also who are the members that produce this good balance of gender and, and wider uh, skill that you mentioned? Um, so and, and, and can the combined authority have more information, please? Uh, very happy to give more information on this meeting. Obviously, in terms of reference for appendix two, the budget is to be found um, as a line in the camera. Yeah. on screen. Um, thank you very much. Yes, the is there. Um, yeah, I have um, Andy Wood is the chairman of the Bessie invited uh, by the mayor to uh, form the commission and has um, uh, invited four people to join. And I wonder, Chairman, whether it would be appropriate to name those people today because you haven't formally written to them to no, invite them. No, I haven't formally written to them, but uh, uh, they've not been. Uh, I have not chosen these people. They've been chosen entirely uh, independently. I haven't met them. Uh, but of course, there's a full process around this where I have to fully invite them. Uh, there is an exact gender balance. Uh, I'm sure that's perfectly pleased uh, to, to hear of men and women. I'm sure I'm phrasing correctly. Uh, but uh, what we will do is when they have been invited, we will circulate those names. I think it will be more important. That's right. And it may be helpful to say that the kind of profile we are looking at is. Uh, the chairman of a very prominent local charity with a background in senior management. Um, uh, somebody who was working with Norman Lamb, actually, the former health minister on health and care integration, and people who have very good form um, in relevant fields to know this area as well as in the subject matter. Now, very appropriately, Jess, you're going to come So, forward. just to say, we have to work with Wes Huckabee on the proposal. Um, I think it's quite important for the to know how the Commission might, involve, might engage with the health sector going forward because I haven't had much, much information about that. Yeah, so for the Commission itself, it's obviously many the doors and they have had their initial scope of meeting. Um, what I would probably agree with the Chairman of the Commission that their first meeting would be just them uh, putting their heads together about how they want to work. But obviously, given the subject matter, how they work with the public, it's a little bit more important. I think it should be a challenge of efforts. Okay. 
<coughs> if it isn't in terms of reference, <coughs> if, if, if that's not clear enough, perhaps I refer you back to the way uh, paragraph 62 to 67 of the evolution of DLR are written. There is great clarity in that how governments must work together around all this, and that is the spirit in which we're approaching this work. And the time frame for the first meeting? Um, as usual, we're wrestling with by very senior people's diaries, um, but the ambition is uh, the last week of October, the end of November. Thank you, Mr. Quick. Well, on page 394, obviously this Commission has got a very big job to do, and yet the very last sentence in um, 1.2H says the Commission is also invited to broaden its inquiry and report on the wider case for reform of the public sector in Cambridge and Peterborough during 2019. Should it not be focused? What does that mean? Then? I think, if I, I, mean, I think we need to, 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 to be clear where we are. So, Risk Public are working for the Home Authority as a consultee uh, alongside our health partners uh, and, uh, uh, to, and, and the County Council uh, and City Council of Peterborough to provide uh, a paper for us to take to government on devolution of health to the Home Authority. The public sector reform work will obviously have involvement in that, but their remit is wider as per the devolution deal to look at local government uh, uh, provision in Cambridgeshire and Peter. So their main focus will be around local government reform, but they will feed in through the work that public are doing with the health partners on public sector reform. And you can indeed, may I just to add to that, um, as I recall an earlier uh, informal discussion with some of the people in the room did have agenda items for what that might conversation about before we might involve. I, I will make it very clear, uh, again, I have stated this publicly on many occasions, that Andy Wood is entirely independent, he's chosen his team independently, uh, and he will speak equally uh, to the leaders of this authority, other leaders of this authority, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the public sector of representatives across the local government sector. So I think that uh, I want to make it very clear that the, 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 the intent is for this to be a fully independent report that we can trust uh, has the ground tax around his position and, uh, and his independence. Any further speakers? Yeah, uh, th thank you, Mayor. I, I think it's um, probably widely acknowledged na nationally that Cambridgeshire is at the very forefront of public sector reform, having been the um, forerunner and the creation of the LGSF, which is the, large, is the largest public sector shared service provider in the UK, uh, sharing a chief executive with uh, John Peterborough, which is the most senior shared post in the UK, and our transformation program. Uh, we welcome this. Uh, Further so transformation, uh, uh, heading in the right direction with our, with our hacking and endorsement. Uh, we will do right, what's right for the people of Cambridgeshire and Peterborough to the best of our abilities. Um, and whilst we have this important uh, work going on, I, I've just noticed on Twitter that the most exciting thing for this afternoon for the Combined Authority was my use of the word ladies instead of me. <laughs> uh, I'm not really sure why that's such a difficult thing, seeing as um, the person who complained used the word gentleman. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, 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 Quite intentional, I'm sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> To anybody I've given offence to, but I mean, dare to call them a lady, I've apologised. It's a kind of words you didn't really need to work <laughs> 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 Any further comments? So, uh, do you have a proposal, please? And a second. Uh, all those in favour? Thank you very much. Uh, I can't say unanimous because uh, Councillor Holditch has left the room. Uh, now, uh, I will move on without bias to the next item on the agenda, uh, 2.4, uh, which is the uh, uh, Southern Railway Station for the technical work. Uh, Asher Williams, welcome uh, to the, uh, uh, the meeting. Uh, Asher is standing in for the Director of Transport and Technical Support. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so, the paper that was written is around Stone Rail Station and bringing forward the station and the completion of this current stage, which is Script 3. That's um, Network Rail's Government for Rail Infrastructure Project, Script 3, which looks at 
the option development around service station mm -hmm. and how we bring forward a single option and then progress that to detailed design and then construction and completion. And um, service station is really important because it's our key opportunity to enable sustainable growth in the region. Actually, 86% um, of residents support a station in Soham, and based on census data, it's the largest um, settlement in England without a station. So this is really hindering growth in the area. A lot of people are still using uh, the car to get around private car, and this is detrimental in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and also <coughs> air pollution. Um, a lot of people do not have access to public transport because there's no rail station, and it's fundamental because the line crosses through um, so that a station is built and provided. Um, I think it's also really important in terms of the discussions we've had around housing growth and employment, that so we can bring forward these opportunities. Um, so the paper asks for 1.7 million for the completion of Brick 3 and to look at accelerating the delivery of SOEM. Um, it's really important that we bring forward SOEM faster because if we do want to unlock housing growth and employment, then we need to build the station and get people access in public transport, especially in terms of inequality. If you don't have access to a private car, then, then you're significantly limited in accessing employment opportunities. Um, and also, another principle in the paper is the innovation of the DSA. So, um, SOEM was taken over from the County Council, and we need to innovate the Development Service Agreement, which is the existing legal agreement that stands between um, the County Council and Network Rail. Um, the paper asks to delegate the terms of this DSA innovation to, um, to, to the CPCA and CFO, um, and the paper also requests that um, I will bring forward future papers in terms of acceleration and delivering brick four to eight to the service station to look at options for acceleration and investment in the station. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions on that, I'm happy to answer them. Okay, uh, so open to the committee, Councillor Herbert. Well, I, I think improvements to the rail system uh, should be at the heart of what we're in business for, and I'm looking forward also to the Cambridge Rail Study, because I do think that often with fairly moderate input, we can get a big improvement. The two questions I've got are first, um, what, what's the deal in terms of us taking this over from the county council? What's the benefit to uh, us and its delivery? Um, I presume it might save the county council some money. Um, and second, um, having looked at the, a report which went to East Cambridge, um, as I do, um, back in 2012, um, where it estimated that the cost was going to be approximately six million. I just want to understand what's the difference between that six million and what's roughly 21 million, and what's the change in the project that merits that increase? So Which we decided we decided to take over the project so that we could accelerate the delivery of service station um, and also to save the county council the cost. So we will be reimbursing them for those costs associated with, with so. And um, when the county council had the station, their, their delivery time was just program. Sorry, just stop you. At that point, it's not agreed at this point in time. So you can hold that Around no, three. Around the funding. Around the cost of brick three. Um, <laughs> and so we agreed to that. Um, we would, we would accelerate the delivery of service station. So the program when it was held with the county council, it was to deliver in 2023. So far we've accelerated the program so it can be delivered in 2022. And we're also looking at ways to further accelerate that to, de to deliver it sooner so that we can bring the benefits forward for the residents. Um, in terms of the cost, um, this is to do with Network Rail's um, costing process. So obviously you have a, a concept for a project and you create an indicative figure based on benchmark of, of other a similar projects. But then you go into an optioneering phase where you look at all the sustainable options, value for money options, and the best way to deliver a station in that area, considering that there's a really train line and that there are several level crossings. Um, and that gives us a, a range of different scenarios for a station. And those costs ranged from 19 million to the, the 21 million. That's excluding risk on top of that. Um, and so we found that this particular option to bring forward zone station was the most uh, beneficial for the area in terms of bringing forward a station. We need to close the public level crossing because you can't have more trains passing through at that speed. Um, 
and people crossing it's, it's a health and safety hazard. So we need to build over a footbridge. So additional costs have been factored in that we didn't anticipate. Um, and from that, we've made a detailed cost estimate of those factors. And that's how we've come to the current figure. Uh, yeah, just a, a couple of points. Um, uh, one's on the funding, which is at the back of the table, which is sort of the overall uh, uh, project fund uh, going into the CPCA project. This is similar to the way that the account council handles funding. We, we've put it in the budget, but that actually hasn't been approved by the uh, combined authority, or, nor was it in the past approved by the account council, that actually they paid for it, the money needs to be found. So when we're looking for the money, it may be that the paper comes to mind and going forward and asking to come in. It may be the business board through the going and coming to places. In fact, the Devo document uh, in the days of the let identified that as the main work. That's what we're doing. Network browser wants to increase patronage on a bit. So yes, we build it in the budget, but the actual funding mechanism has yet to be gone through a process that's a support and we do it. But in terms of handing it over from the uh, county council to the uh, combined authority, uh, what we've got is a number of projects and uh, things like the you know, for example, uh, the county council was the transport authority as part of these projects. It's no longer the transport authority. So, you know, things, if they want to be built for transport reasons, it's really the combined authority doing it now. So it's entirely appropriate that the combined authority takes over this project. Councillor Bill. Thank, thank you. Uh, just for my uh, benefit, uh, paragraph 2.3 mentions the total cost of stage 3 at 2.5 million, 1.5 million of which has already been allocated. Yet we're being asked for a, a supplementary budget of 1.7, which takes up from my simple maths to 3.2 million. So, uh, yep, so the additional 1.7 is to cover the council council costs as well the consultants and the risk margin as well on top of the current group estimate. So the, the additional 1.5 is for network growth completion of their group rate and the additional 2.2 is for the additional requirements that you around with consultants and the council council costs for continuing to process our invoices because as yet until we know the agreements, um, they're still processing network growth invoices and they're still undertaking a role on the project until legally so the 1.7 million in excess of the two is, is for the admin side of it. No, no, 1.5 million is what we initially um, provided for the project for Group 3. The Group 3 estimate from Network Girls was 3 million, so we are allocating an additional 1.5 million. That creates 3 million. And then we are requesting an, uh, an additional 0.2 million on top of that for the admin side of things. Yeah. Um, so I've been involved in this for a while, which you're probably aware, uh, uh, 10 years now. And the reality is it's been difficult all the way through because the funding has always been difficult to find. The County Council didn't have a lot of funding. So we had to, uh, through the county, continually apply for more funding. But I, I, I think that this raises a lot of issues. I think Sound Station raises a lot of issues uh, on how we deliver infrastructure nationally. The reality is, but by the time we put a single brick down to deliver this station in Soho, which is recognised as something that's badly needed in the local area, we would have spent £10 million on reports, admin. That's entirely in line with the grid process. That's something we cannot avoid. And that's 10 million pounds of taxpayers' money. And when the man or woman in the pub, and they do, say to me, how can a station for solar possibly cost 21 million? It's very difficult to get across to, it, uh, to them that it costs you 10 million pounds just to plan it. Just to plan it. That's, t that's totally unacceptable. We have to try to make sure through continual pressure on government and the department and on network rail that they change the way that they deliver infrastructure. Because the total cost, the actual cost of putting two platforms in and a bridge between, between them is probably no more than two and a half million quid. Yet this will cost us 21 million pounds. It cost all of us that. Now that's half the cost of the Cambridge <coughs> North Station but it's still, in my opinion, morally defunct. 
and it absolutely causes problems because for 21 million there could be doing improvements to far more stations around the area and there are improvements that need to be made. This was with Foxton, uh, there's nine million pounds on Fenland stations already. You know, this is money that could be spent on far more projects than just this one. And believe you me, I'm not looking on the importance of this station because I've been living it for a long while. But it is in my view, fundamentally wrong, the, the, the minor piece of infrastructure, a relatively minor piece of infrastructure, should cost £21 million. It does make it less important. Just to go back to your point, the 1.7 million, 1.5 of that is network rail money. Yes. Yeah. So that's not necessarily the cost of this one. That is risk and consultant and admin fees. Okay, thank you. And that's in the breakdown in appendix F. Sorry, you're right. So uh, I'm going to propose this from the chair. <coughs> uh, Council account. Uh, all those in favour? Thank you very much. And Jamie, thank you. Uh, business rate pilot is two.